So first of all, I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank Matt and uh, everyone else from the Minneapolis VMUG for uh, putting this event together. Um, I got to say, when I first got the uh, request to come out and speak to you guys uh, for this event, I was uh, delighted to have an EUC focused event because that's kind of my passion. It's where I've uh, spent uh, over 20 years of my career. And so when I heard about this event, I was like, yes, I'm absolutely there. I'll, I'll certainly make the time. So thank you very much to Matt and everyone on the, on the uh, steering committee for uh, putting this together. It's a, it's a great opportunity. So uh, I was asked to come here and talk to you guys about what VMware has been doing recently in end-user computing, specifically around uh, Workspace ONE uh, and Horizon 7. These are two things that we announced about two or three weeks ago. And I want to kind of walk you guys through a couple of things um, in these, about these products and about these solutions. Uh, but first, um, while I know some of you, I know many of you probably don't uh, know anything about me, so I want to give you a quick amount of background on myself just so you understand kind of where I came from. Uh, prior to joining VMware a year and a half ago, I spent a little over 20 years uh, in consulting. Uh, my focus in consulting was design and architecture of large-scale VDI, RDSH, terminal services, application virtualization, and enterprise mobility management. Um, I was independent for about 17 or 18 of those uh, 21 years. Uh, I ran my own consulting practice for about uh, 16, 17 years. Most of my focus was all uh, large enterprise. I didn't really do small mid-market customers. I, I dealt with primarily uh, uh, large financial services uh, uh, companies. Uh, I spent about six years as a Microsoft MVP on terminal services or RDSH, uh, kind of advising Microsoft on long-term strategy for the uh, RD, RDSH uh, and RDVH platforms. And I spent uh, eight years as a Citrix CTP. So I kind of built my career uh, based on Citrix technology. And uh, a lot of people kind of ask me, like, if you've been involved with Citrix for over 20 years, what are you doing at VMware now? Um, and, uh, and the answer to that question is, over the course of the last two or three years, I started seeing kind of a tectonic shift happening in end-user computing where uh, Citrix was having some leadership challenges, some product quality challenges, some strategy challenges. And during that time, VMware got very serious about EUC. Now, keep in mind, VMware invented VDI. But for a long time, they were somewhat stagnant when it came to end-user computing, and Citrix was the clear market leader. But in the course of the last 24 months uh, or so since Sanjay Poonin took over, uh, we, they've just been firing on all cylinders. And so it seemed like a very exciting time for me to, uh, to get involved with VMware. And so I joined VMware late in September 2014 to lead desktop product strategy. And uh, as of January 1st, I took over as the CTO for overall end-user computing. Uh, what my role as a CTO is to set our long-term product strategy for both our desktop products, Horizon, uh, and our mobile products, AirWatch. Uh, now we have lots of people at VMware that do strategy and product management and that kind of stuff. My team's focus is really what we need to be doing from a one year to three year time horizon period. Uh, the reason why I say that time period is everything from you know, today through the next 12 months, our product management teams already have a very good idea on what we're gonna be doing from a release perspective, um, but they don't typically have longer term plans. And the reason why I end the strategy at three years is because I, I simply don't believe you can predict IT beyond three years. All the people that write these five and seven year technology plans, it's, it's just crazy. It just can't work that way. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to um, talk about a couple of things that VMware has been doing in EUC and kind of how this impacted my journey uh, to end up at <laughs> VMware. Um, VMware acquired a company named Destone in November 2014, and I was an advisor to Destone uh, before the acquisition, and that was kind of like my first glimpse or moment where VMware might be getting a lot more serious about end-user computing. And uh, I'm very pleased that we've got Ken Ringdahl here to talk to you guys about uh, Horizon Air Hybrid Mode. Uh, Ken was the chief architect over at Destone, so I've known him for several years, and probably without a doubt, one of the smartest people in VDI and DAS uh, in the market today. So I'm really happy to have Ken here talking to you guys about uh, uh, hybrid mode. Then uh, over time, uh, VMware did some other interesting things. Horizon 6 uh, in, uh, in April of, uh, of 2014 was the first time that VMware actually introduced RDSH or terminal services or published apps. Prior to that, VMware was a single product company. All we did was virtual desktops. Um, and we were basically giving that market to Citrix to own in the published app space. And uh, this was the first opportunity where VMware actually put out a product that did both VDI and RDSH. Um, later on that year, we uh, introduced to something named Horizon Flex in October. And I don't know if you guys know much about the Horizon Flex product or what the use cases are for it, but uh, if you know of a technology company named Mocha 5, which is now out of business, but um, they were kind of blazing the trail in this market, uh, what Horizon Flex is designed to do is when you have 
Uh, bring your own device scenarios or contractor use cases where you don't want to manage, you don't want to take the liability of managing those devices. Uh, you can deliver a virtual machine onto the physical laptop uh, where you can apply a lot of security policies like encryption, copy paste controls, those types of things, and centrally manage the corporate virtual machine image, but let it exist on someone's own laptop. So it's kind of like a type two hypervisor VM. So it runs on top of VMware Player or VMware Fusion. Uh, and allows you to run a corporate VM image that's centrally managed out to a distributed field of laptop users. Um, and then in uh, 2015, we uh, announced the acquisition of a Dutch company named Medio in uh, February of 2015. Uh, myself and Ken and several other people worked on the due diligence of that for several months. Um, and what Amedio does is uh, user environment management technology. So pretty much if you think about a normal desktop operating environment, everything that user needs for drive mappings, printer connections, environment variables, all those types of things uh, can be managed by the, uh, the Amedio product. And uh, what's interesting about user environment management is it's really focused around contextual settings. And what contextual settings refers to is I might want to have a static, static set of settings for, for a user when they come into their desktop, but I might also want to vary those things based upon the location they're coming in. So uh, if somebody is coming in from an offshore location, you might want to block access to certain things. Um, if somebody is in a hospital operating environment, you might have them on the third floor one day and the second floor the next day. You might want to reconnect their printers to make it to the local printer where they're located. So things like that can be done through user environment management. Uh, we made an announcement in May of something called Project Enzo. Uh, which is ultimately what Ken will be talking about a little bit later. We, uh, the, the project name Enzo has been replaced with Horizon Air Hybrid Mode. And what we're trying to do with Enzo is a number of different things. First of all, we believe that even though the cost of virtual desktops has come down significantly over time and it's near cost neutral uh, with that of a physical PC, um, it still could be made better. So a lot of the focus on Enzo is to build your virtual desktop infrastructure on top of hyper-converged infrastructure or on traditional vSAN ready nodes. Um, but most of the focus on Enzo, from my point of view, isn't about the CapEx. It's not about driving a CapEx cost down of the desktop, because um, as I said, that's near cost neutral with the physical PC. The problem is physical PC management is still incredibly expensive. Most organizations find themselves putting anywhere between three to 10 times the uh, amount of ca CapEx that they spend on physical desktops. They put that into the operational cost of managing them. And we think that's kind of crazy. So a lot of the focus we're doing around virtual desktops in general, but specifically in Project Enzo, is how do we cut down the amount of operational cost that's required to run virtual desktops and make it simpler and easier to do? And that's what we focused on in Project Enzo. The last one I'm going to touch on here is uh, Project A Squared. And by the way, these things that are projects aren't actually products. We announced them as efforts we're designing, but they're not actually GA-ready products yet. Um, Project A Squared is something we announced at VMworld last year. And what we basically uh, observed is that as people look at the way that they do enterprise desktop management, you've got your physical desktop laptops that are traditionally done with a, a PCLM tool like Landesk, Alteris, Microsoft System Center. And then when you go to virtual desktop, you basically say those tools don't work because you can't do software distribution across thousands of virtual desktops simultaneously. You've got to do staggered distributions and it just it creates a lot of operational complexity. So what most people have done in VDI world is actually used a different set of tools to do app delivery, a different set of tools to do image management, and a different set of tools to do patching. And that's kind of crazy because now you have two ways of doing things. Um, and that's also true when you add in terminal services or RDSH. So you end up having multiple different specialist teams using multiple different tools. Uh, in addition, when mobility management came around, people started doing smartphones and tablets. There's yet another tool that manages smartphones and tablets. So uh, the focus of Project A Squared is to start to bring some unification between endpoint management. So whether it's a desktop, laptop, smartphone, uh, uh, whatever the case may be, we want to have one way of doing things. And the, the key tenets of Project A Squared is uh, AirWatch device management for everything, uh, along with our app volumes technology for just-in-time app delivery. So uh, I'm not going to cover that in too much more detail, but uh, some exciting news will be coming on that uh, uh, later this year. Um, what I want to spend most of my time focusing on is the things that we announced in the last uh, two weeks. And um, what we announced in the last two weeks was a couple of different releases. Uh, one was Horizon Air uh, Hybrid Mode, one was uh, Workspace ONE, one was App Volumes 3.0, and one was AirWatch 8.3. So I'm going to spend most of the time talking about these, uh, these things. We spent a lot of time in the EUCBU trying to bridge the gap between what we call consumer simplicity and enterprise security. And what we're really focused on here is if you think about an iPhone or an Android phone, you can hand it to any person, whether or not they've ever used that device, 
and they can find their way to the App Store, download applications, and become productive. We want to try to find the same way to make enterprise IT that simple. Now, I don't mean to make any illusions that it's like we're going to turn a key and get there tomorrow. This is going to be a long journey that we're all going to have to take, but we want to drive that consumer simplicity out of the very, very complex set of things we do today. And in addition, of course, we got to make sure we, we, we bridge what the users want with what IT wants, which is to make sure it's secure. So a lot of our focus is on consumer simplicity balanced with enterprise security. And a lot of our messaging uh, in the last year or so has been focused on any application across any device. When we say any application, we mean a Windows app, a Linux desktop, a Windows desktop, a SaaS application, a mobile application across any of these devices, desktop, laptop, mobile phone, tablet, whatever. And, um, and I mentioned before that and there's a lot of complexity in desktop, laptop, VDI, RDSH management, uh, and enterprise mobility management. There's all these different tools, all these different specialist teams, and a lot of organizations are finding themselves starting to converge their mobile team and their desktop team into one end user computing team. Uh, in fact, I started seeing that happen about four or five years ago, but in the last, I'd say, year or two, it's been happening at almost every customer I talk to that they've merged those teams into one and made basically an endpoint management team. So any related application, data, collaboration services falls under one team, whether it's a smartphone, tablet, or desktop, laptop, or even VDI. And that's actually a really good thing. Um, and as I mentioned, there's kind of a convergence occurring within systems management uh, where people don't want to discern between a device, whether it's mobile or whether it's fixed function uh, laptop, desktop. Um, and this convergence idea of merging management of all these devices under one set of tools is not something that just VMware is talking about. If you look at any of the analyst reports in the last year or two from Gartner, IDC, Forrester, they're all talking about something called third platform convergence of systems management. So they're saying that tools like System Center, Lambda, Skelteris, that are brick and mortar legacy tools that have been around for 25, 30 years, they're fine, but they're not equipped to manage devices that are outside the four walls of your organization. And they've never been good at managing branch office scenarios where you've got 10 people sitting in a branch office because you often have to distribute all this infrastructure all throughout the world, uh, in the case of System Center, BDPs, in order to kind of have your images and have your apps delivered. So we're seeing a lot of focus around convergence of tools and platforms. And then, of course, there's continued consumerization and continued explosion of apps. So um, we spend a lot of time talking about digital workspace. And digital workspace um, and digital transformation in general is really a technology trend that's occurring in organizations where they are trying to equip their employees and customers with the tools they need to get their job done, regardless of where they are and whatever device they're on, and most importantly, make sure they can service their customers at every single touch point interaction with their customers throughout the entire life cycle. That's what digital transformation is all about. Now, when we say digital workspace, it's really more of a kind of an IT-centric point of view, like how do we deliver those tools to the people to allow them to service the customers? And um, what we're focused on for digital workplace is a consolidation of all applications that people need into a single place using, uh, having the ability to get to those from any device using a single identity. And identity is a very, very key tenant of the work that we're doing. Um, and the reason is that your identity is really what intermediates between the user and the applications and all the back-end infrastructure you're trying to access. The identity is the glue that brings that together. And honestly, identity, if it's not done correctly, it becomes a huge frustration for, for your user population. Uh, how many people like to uh, have to go, you're on the go, you need to get a piece of information really quick, you're at an airport, you open your laptop lid, you log in, you open a VPN, you get your two-factor, you open the thing up, you do that whatever, and like five minutes later, you got that 30 seconds of information you needed. That's the problem we're trying to fix with digital work, workspace. Uh, Self-service automation, all of that's key, a key tenant of this. And then, of course, one platform to make sure we can serve all user segments. So Workspace ONE, something that we launched about two weeks ago. And um, I, I think that Workspace ONE is something that's, that's been, you know, been coming for a long time. This is something that we didn't just think of you know, six months ago and decide we're going to launch this thing. We've been laying the groundwork for this for about two or three years. Um, but we're happy to finally bring it to market. And, and the focus of Workspace ONE is really to kind of put your employees in control. There's a couple of things that's been happening around mobile device management. The average user is like terrified of Big Brother and what it means when your device is enrolled in MDM. Like, what does systems management mean? Um, and we spent a lot of time in AirWatch 8.3 focusing on end user privacy and helping people understand what it means to have your device enrolled. Here's the problem. We have to be willing to give up some level of control 
of our devices in order to satisfy enterprise IT security requirements. The problem is users don't understand what level of control IT has, and IT thinks users are just being you know, uh, stubborn about it. So when AirWatch 8.3 spent a lot of time focusing on educating people, what does it mean to have a device enrolled in an MDM? Because there's varying degrees of MDM enrollment and capabilities. So we have this website we put out there called whatisairwatch.com, and it's sort of just a way to educate you on what AirWatch actually does. And in, in uh, AirWatch 8.3, we put a lot of emphasis and focus on end users understanding exactly what they're giving up when they enroll their device. And the way that we see this as being kind of a stepped offering in Workspace ONE, if you don't want to enroll your device, or if you're on like a kiosk type device, you can use the web-based portal to get to Workspace ONE and get access to all your applications. Now you might have some constraints in terms of what you can do with those applications because we know that we can't wipe the device. We don't have any kind of a management agent, so you might have a restricted set of what you can actually accomplish there, but you should be able to get browser-based access to all your resources. Then if you want to step up and use your own device, now it's a circumstance where you at least know it's, it's an own device by you, so we can give it a little more trust, give you a little more capability, and then, if you want to step up into what's called device registration, device registration is a new thing within AirWatch where we're putting a light touch flavor of MDM down. We don't give the ability to do full device level wipe, but we have to put some kind of an agent on the device to be able to insert certificates onto the mobile phone. The reason why certificates are important is in order to do single sign-on, we have to be able to assert a certificate to log a user into that service. So that device registration gives you that kind of light touch management that allows us to get just enough management to enable some functionality for the user, but not give us device wipe level capability. And then as you go up to you know, corporate issued device or whatever, we can do full-blown device management with full-blown device wipe if you want. So we can have a graded level of capability where users can opt in for as much as they want to give up for more functionality. And by the way, in AirWatch 8.3, what we're doing now is when a device gets enrolled, the screen that you receive from AirWatch tells you exactly what IT can and cannot see on your device. So there's a perception out there right now that when you roll device in MDM, that people can read your text messages, that IT can read your text message, and they can read your personal email, can see the photos of your kids. The reality is iOS and Android have never allowed those things with MDM profiles. But there's a perception by end users that this is what we're doing when we put an MDM agent down. So in AirWatch 8.3, we've done a lot of work to kind of give the people a friendly screen that says, by opting into this enrollment, this is what we can see, this is what we can't see. And then from an end user perspective, they're like, oh, that's not really as bad as I thought it was. And by the way, this has been how things have been for a long time. I mean, provisioning profiles got introduced in like iOS 4. It's been around for years. And yet people have this perception that MDM means you can wipe my whole device. So we're spending a lot of time focusing on granular levels of step up, uh, additional privileges that you get, and then of course additional uh, privacy that you give up. So a couple of features of Workspace ONE. Self-service access is key, making sure you can choose your own device. Uh, we have a secure email, chat, content-based application. I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, conditional access is a way that we can provide more access to confidential data or the ability to download confidential data if your device is enrolled and we can ensure that it's not rooted and that it's got the proper patches on it and those types of things. And then scalable automation I'll talk about in just a moment. So self-service access is basically this. If you go from a laptop desktop device, you sign into a web-based portal with your user ID and password, two-factor if you want to use it, and at that point in time, you'll have access to all of your Windows apps, Windows desktops, Linux desktops, SaaS applications, mobile applications. Well, mobile applications don't work on a laptop, but you get all the applications except for mobile. And if you use the Workspace ONE app from a smartphone or tablet, you get the aggregate of all of them. Your remoted Windows applications from the data center, your SaaS applications, and your mobile applications. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a one-stop shop for all, all resources that you need. A very important thing we introduced in this as well is uh, an industry-first one-touch mobile single sign-on. And, uh, and why this is important is, for the last couple of years, many vendors uh, in the identity space have been doing single sign-on to SaaS-based applications. So if you bring up a browser, you go to salesforce.com, it'll pick up your credentials, do a SAML assertion, log you into Salesforce, and you're happy. Uh, the problem is that breaks down when it comes to mobile apps, because mobile apps don't necessarily have that same single sign-on enabled for the native mobile application. Um, we built a new industry-first mobile single sign-on solution that leverages a cloud-based 
um, uh, a Kerberos Key Distribution Center builds a, a kind of a three-way trust between the mobile application, the SaaS provider, and your on-prem PKI. So uh, very exciting technology offering there. And we're able to uh, use this with something like Touch ID on iOS, that once you Touch ID and authenticate to Workspace ONE, now you can run your Windows apps, web apps, and mobile apps without having to sign in a second time. So it's very exciting stuff. Uh, mobile SSO, I kind of already talked about this, the three-way trust between the SaaS app, the, um, the Workspace ONE environment, and the mobile app itself. Um, we'll be sharing more details about this in the future, but this is an industry-first technology that VMware slash AirWatch has built. Um, so I expect there to be a lot of great things coming from this in the future. Uh, secure email, chat, and content. Um, VMware had, or I should say AirWatch VMware, had a uh, prior inbox uh, application for secure sandbox mobile email. Um, and we did an acquisition of a company named Boxer late last year, which has kind of a, um, a, more, a more beautiful, uh, easy to use email experience that allows you to do things like embedding third party EFSS content links from Dropbox and Box directly into the email. Um, has a lot of great functionality for um, uh, swipe interactions to delete email, uh, archive it, uh, flag it as spam, all those kind of things. So it's a very beautiful email experience. Um, now, I want to talk really quickly about um, sandboxed email versus native email, because this is a topic I think that's very important to discuss around mobile device usage. Um, anyone who's been around for a year, I'm not going to pick on the vendor in, 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 in particular that had this, but one of the first vendors that had sandboxed mobile email was used very heavily in the, um, uh, in the, in the financial services industry. Um, they, they got a fairly bad rap because people didn't like the user experience. Um, and they kind of revolted against it and wanted native email. And what a lot of people have done is given people native email through ActiveSync and other mechanisms, but there are some security challenges around traditional Active, ActiveSync in terms of making sure the content can't, uh, can't be lifted off the device. So we have this sandbox mobile uh, email client solution. People sometimes say to me, our users hate a non-native email experience, so, so we're not doing that. We, we, we gotta give them native email. And my argument there is, is twofold. One, um, depending on your acceptance of the platform security, you may want to make different choices depending on platforms. What I mean by that is many um, CISOs of uh, companies, when they set their security policy, they're pretty comfortable with how secure iOS is at this stage. They're uh, comfortable accepting the, the base security that's in the iOS platform. When it comes to Android, there's a huge amount of fragmentation in Android. I mean, this shouldn't be something any of you haven't heard a hundred times before. Um, but some of the security controls that allow for work and personal data separation haven't existed in Android really until the Lollipop release. And that only covers about 25% of all Android devices on the market. So what I often see customers doing, or CISOs doing, is making a policy decision that says, for BYOD, we'll allow native email on iOS, but for Android, we have, we're going to force it through sandbox mail just to be able to provide the security controls that we want. And that's, of course, up to your own organization and, and what you want to do. But the other caveat I'd say as well is that um, with sandboxed email, you can actually change the game from a user experience perspective. When it comes to native email on iOS and Android, you're always going to be constrained with what those vendors decide to enable in their native email experience. So Apple and Google may never choose to allow you to insert OneDrive content directly from your mobile email client. If you want that functionality where all your documents are in OneDrive or in an on-prem SharePoint or in Google Drive or Dropbox or, or, or a box or whatever, that's a situation where a third-party mail experience can give you significantly more functionality than what the native email supplies. So there's, there's use cases and reasons to do both. Uh, conditional access, I'll just touch on this briefly. This is a component of both uh, AirWatch mobile platform as well as our VMware Identity Manager platform. What we do with conditional access is we take the context of the user and the context of the device into account when we provide access to resources. So what I mean by this is if a person takes a BYOD device and downloads salesforce.com from their, from their uh, app store, um, first of all, they might not be able to actually sign into it because they may not know the Salesforce instance name to actually get them to the right Salesforce server to log them in. But if they do figure all that out, you might not want them to access Salesforce from a device that you can't actually wipe because you might have some security concerns there. So through our Identity Manager product, because we intermediate the authentication between the user or the device and Salesforce, we perform what's called a SAML redirect, uh, we can basically say, if this is not an enrolled device, you can't log in to salesforce.com. You're blocked access. So this is not something where we block them from running the app or any of that kind of stuff because we don't have an agent there to stop any of that. We just handle it through the authentication path to say, it's not a trusted device. We're not going to allow it to log in. Or you might want to say, 
There are certain applications like on-premises where I want to give them access from a BYO device, but I want to hide certain elements of the application, things that contain PII or things that contain some kind of account data or whatever the case may be. I don't want them to get to that information from a unsecured or untrusted mobile device. So you'll basically just block out access to those part of the app or block out the ability to download content. But if they're coming from a device that is trusted and is in a trusted location, then you can allow unfettered access to the entire application. That's what conditional access is all about. Um, a couple things that are a part of uh, conditional access. We have something called uh, Dynamic Per App VPN. This is available on iOS and Android and, and, uh, and Windows 10 now. What Per App VPN is all about is traditionally, if I back up five or 10 years, what everyone did for mobile workers was give them a full-blown IPsec or SSL VPN tunnel on their laptop into the data center. Now, if there's any malicious software on that person's machine, the security team would find it, clobber their VPN connection, and then go remediate and clean up. That's kind of crazy. You don't want to give people a full tunnel network connection into, into the data center. So a lot of OS platforms, iOS, Android, and Windows 10, have now developed the ability to have a per-application VPN tunnel. What this basically means is that we wrap a process, an individual process, and tunnel it into the data center. But there's still risk that if that process is malicious, it has unfettered access to the entire data center to start mounting attacks on all your infrastructure. So what we've done is we've combined the per app VPN capability with intelligent networking with NSX, where we can now control down to a specific IP address or uh, network segment or port uh, exactly what that mobile app is able to talk to. So we've combined the AirWatch technology with NSX in a very smart way um, so that you can uh, really kind of constrain the view of the, of the data center. Uh, so Workspace ONE, we have a couple of different editions uh, of Workspace ONE. I don't want to get into a whole kind of like product pitch and why you should buy one versus the other, but the reason why we did this, um, we, we found in the past, we had a product, we had a suite of products named Workspace uh, Suite, and it was basically the high-end edition of AirWatch and the high-end edition of Horizon, and if you need both mobility and VDI and RDSH, whatever, you'd buy the suite at a lower price and get everything. Um, but we find in some situations, customers say, I don't need VDI or RDSH for every user. I need it for like 3,000 people. And I need something for BYO for mobile secure email for like 6,000 people. And then I need unified device management for like 10,000 people. I don't want to buy this one SKU that has everything for all my people because I don't need all of it for all my people. So what we've done with Workspace ONE is structured it such that at the low end over there on Standard Edition, that's more focused on like a mobile device, a bring your own mobile device, bring your own laptop that just needs secure email and, and identity management, some very simple things. Then if you want unified device management, which is that Project A squared offering we talked about, that would be the next edition up. And then if you need VDI or RDSH, published apps, Windows desktops, Linux desktops, then you buy the high-end enterprise edition for those users. So you can basically segment out your population and buy what you need rather than buying the kitchen sink. Um, I should also mention too, we, um, we did, for the first time ever, start offering our software in a SaaS-style consumption model. Now this doesn't mean that VMware stuff runs completely SaaS and it's all cloud-based. It just means that we've changed the consumption model from being based on box product style mentality to being offered as a subscription. How are we doing on time? Are we still 20 minutes? Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this just to cover some of the more of the detail of what's in the different Workspace ONE packages. I want to make sure I get to talk, a chance to talk about Horizon 7 really quick. Um, so Horizon 7, uh, along with Workspace ONE, along with AirWatch 8.3 um, and Horizon Air Hybrid Mode, probably the biggest set of releases VMware EUC has done ever. Um, certainly the biggest release that, that I've been involved in in the last year and a half, um, but I think probably the biggest release in, in the history of VMware EUC. So um, Horizon does a lot of different things. I'm going to touch on each one of these things in more detail. And, and by the way, these are only like seven things that we've baked in there that um, is about you know seven of about 40 things we've done. Um, but they're kind of the most important things I want to talk about. So I'm going to dig into each one of these really quick. Um, this one I'm going to just glance over because it's, it's really something that's been there since Horizon 6. But effectively, we have a single unified platform for virtual desktops and for published applications. One platform that does both. So nothing particularly new there. Um, great user experience. I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about that because in end user computing, user experience rules all. We got to make sure people are happy with the experience they're getting. And we've invested very, very heavily in Horizon 7 in improving the user experience. Um, to give you guys some context on this, I, I visit a lot of customers a, 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 in my role. I, I get brought in particularly because I've got over 20 years background with Citrix. 
And anytime we're going into competitive deals with Citrix, they're always like, Sean, you're the guy, go out, talk to the customer, tell them what's good, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm very, very transparent with our customers about what we do well and what we don't do well. So I don't go over there and sugarcoat and say, you know, we beat Citrix at everything because there's things Citrix does that are very, very good. Uh, and I don't like to be disingenuous with our customers. I like to make sure I'm, I'm very straight with them. But what I try to tell people, and if you, if you haven't looked at VMware's RDSH and VDI stack in a year or two, and I guess this is a VMware crew, so many of you probably have, um, but when I talk to customers, it's amazing how many of them say, oh yeah, but you guys don't have these 42 features that Citrix has. And I usually show them a slide like this and go, do you realize every quarter we put out a new release of Horizon and we close gaps that Citrix had as features that we didn't have? We do this every single quarter of the year. And we have closed a significant number of remote experience features that Citrix used to have as an advantage that we now have in the platform. So this is always a, a great kind of education slide for people to go, wow, you guys have really been busy. You've been doing a lot of things. In addition, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about VMware Blast Extreme. Um, Blast Extreme is a brand new remoting protocol. I shouldn't say brand new. It's been in development for five years. Um, but it's brand new as in it's, uh, it's now a first class citizen as a remoting protocol in the product. So as you guys probably know, in Horizon, we've had two protocols for quite some time. We've had Microsoft RDP or RemoteFX, and we've had uh, Teradici PC over IP. Um, and these have been in the product for, for many, many years. Um, Blast actually has been in the product for about two and a half, three years. Um, if you ever used our clientless HTML5 access solution, that actually used Blast. We just didn't tell people that Blast was a protocol that was in the product, but it has been there for a while. Uh, in addition, our Linux VDI solution all uses Blast. Um, so what we're doing in Horizon 7 is we're actually making Blast Extreme a first-class citizen protocol, meaning that you'll be able to connect to a virtual desktop using the Blast protocol for many of our client platforms rather than using PC over IP. Now I'll speak, by the way, before anyone starts making assumptions, we are not getting rid of PC over IP in the product. It will continue to be there for as far as I know forever. Uh, because we have had that product, uh, we have had that protocol in our product for a very long time. We have many customers that are dependent on it. They've got PC over IP zero clients they, that they love and they don't want to get rid of. And so our intention is not to offer this as a replacement. It's to offer it as an additional solution. This is the way that we can truly control our own destiny when it comes to a remoting protocol because this is all VMware IP. We own it, we built it, and we've got patents on it. So some of the key things we've done in Blast is really focused on a richer app and user experience. What I mean by that is desktops have evolved significantly in the course of the last 10 years. They become very media rich. In fact, I was looking at some data from Cisco the other day that said uh, as of like 2010, 50% of the internet bandwidth is actually video content. Now, you can say like, oh yeah, people shouldn't be watching YouTube at work, but it's not just about YouTube. It's like learning management systems, people like doing real work that involves video. Uh, and it's just part of our daily job today. So we got to make sure that we've got a rich experience with video content uh, in, their, uh, in their desktops. And even browsing the web these days, like the amount of GIF animations and stuff, that's very media rich. Um, and it just doesn't work well if you don't have a protocol that's optimized for that. So in Blast Extreme, a couple things that are important about it. We actually have two different codecs that are supported in Blast Extreme. There's JPEG ping. Uh, if you don't have a super media rich desktop, like you don't have a lot of video or you don't have anything that's fast moving, but we also have an H.264 based codec version of Blast, and this is automatically made available to you when you make your connection. And the H.264 one is good for a number of different reasons. One, it provides a very high frame rate, very good user experience with a fairly limited amount of bandwidth. But secondarily, almost every device out there, desktop, laptop, smartphone, tablet, has an H.264 hardware decoder chip built into the device. So when you're talking about like a tablet or a smartphone, these H.264 decoders allow you to watch, you know, eight hours of video on your mobile phone without the mobile phone battery being dead. If you didn't have the hardware decoder chip, you'd be doing that in CPU or in software, and your battery would be shot in about two or three hours. So Blast has been optimized for H.264 so that when we're using it for mobile devices, we get, you know, eight hours of battery life using a virtual desktop session rather than having it die at the two or three hour mark. Um, and this also obviously helps cut down on the CPU consumption, so you get a better overall user experience because the CPU is not pegged trying to do the decoding and any other localized processing. We're also uh, optimized for NVIDIA Grid. Um, I don't know how many of you guys out there are using the NVIDIA Grid platform for vGPU, but it's a, a phenomenal platform. Um, we actually optimize Blast for NVIDIA Grid, where in addition to the hardware decoding on the client, we use the NV Inc. video encoder on the NVIDIA grid cards that we offload the encoding operation off the CPU of your VDI hosts and directly into the GPU encoding pipeline. 
We, uh, we can use less bandwidth and deliver a better, higher frame rate, better user experience. Um, this is network friendly, and what I mean by that is it supports both UDP and TCP. So if you're in a situation where you can't connect the UDP port because of firewalls and proxies and NAT, uh, then we can tunnel this through uh, SSL, typical 443, uh, over a TCP-based connection. So that's a, that's a very new thing for us. Um, and then it's, uh, it's also built for cloud. What we mean by that is we've done a lot of work optimizing this protocol for lossy networks. Um, I'll be sharing a blog probably in the next week or so giving kind of a video demonstration of uh, our, this new protocol operating at about 10% packet loss and you would not notice that there was any packet loss at all. We've done a lot of work to make this uh, work well in congested Wi-Fi and, and lossy WAN networks. Um, and then the last one is better battery life. As I mentioned with the H.264, um, we leverage that Harvard decoder chip so we get better battery life on mobile devices. One very important thing about the architecture of VMware's uh, protocol uh, provider is that all of the things that have existed in uh, Horizon for many, many years for things like uh, client drive access and scanner redirection and serial port redirection and all these things, the way that we did the architecture for that is those virtual channels are completely decoupled from the actual protocol itself. So we've kind of seen this diagram, where it's, it's you know, this little marketing version of it, but we're basically saying is all the features that you're used to experiencing on Horizon will work the exact same on Blast as they do on PC over IP. Those features are not part of the PC over IP protocol, that's VMware developed IP, and it's separated from the protocol so we can plug Blast in and get all those same client experience features regardless of which protocol you use. So just to be very clear, don't, don't think that there's this new protocol and it's like you know, half-baked in terms of capabilities and functions. It has all the same capabilities that PC over IP has. And of course, all the great rich client experience across all operating system form factors. Um, Blast Extreme is NVIDIA Grid optimized. As I mentioned, we leverage the H.264 hardware encoder, the NV Inc. components of NVIDIA Grid to actually offload that encoding off the CPU and onto the NVIDIA Grid card. So you get better VDI density and better user experience, lower path latency. Uh, it's, uh, it's a much better solution. Also, uh, we can support 4K resolution displays now with NVIDIA Grid. Um, and one of, our, uh, one of our counterparts from NVIDIA, Jason Southern, who is actually doing a lot of this work with us, uh, had commented on Twitter that it is buttery smooth. So 4K remoted uh, with great user experience. So that's fantastic news. Uh, Just-in-time desktops I'm going to touch on just briefly because we actually have a session by uh, Jim Yannick a little bit later today that's going to talk about this a lot more in depth. Um, this is something that some of you may remember we uh, talked about at VMworld 2014. We first announced our vision for JIT desktops. Uh, unfortunately, it took us a little bit longer than we had hoped to get it to market, but just-in-time desktops is coming in Horizon 7, and it's also coming in Horizon, ha Horizon Air hybrid mode that uh, Ken will be talking about in a bit. The key thing about just-in-time desktops is that unlike traditional link clone uh, view composer technology, where we take a master image, we prep it for cloning, we shut it down, and then we rip off the clones with the differential disks and then power them up. Um, this technology operates on the virtual machine in a powered on state. So uh, the benefit of that is we, we basically perform very similar to like a vMotion process, only we don't move the VM from one host to the other. We actually just fork the child clone off the parent and then bring it up. And when I say bring it up, I don't mean power it up because it was already powered on from the master. We just basically resume the quiesced snapshot. Um, and the advantage of this is, is you basically bypass the bootstorm process. That's not to say there won't be any CPU or any storage I.O. because just resuming the machine will take some of that, but you will avoid a significant amount of read I.O. Uh, boot storm as well as CPU storm from powering on all those machines simultaneously. We can also do this cloning very, very rapidly. This little marketing thing says 20 minutes. That's really 20 minutes of 2,000 desktops across like you know 16 hosts or something like that. But the general time frame is it takes you less than about five seconds to rip off a clone, an instant clone, and it's at the Control-Alt-Delete screen ready to be used. So it's a very, very impressive uh, cloning technology. It'll be coming uh, to the market uh, very soon. Smart policies is something that we've uh, added to Horizon 7. And what smart policies is all about is um, Traditionally, in a Horizon View environment, if you wanted to control things like clipboard access, drive mapping, all those kind of things, we gave you the ability to manipulate those in Microsoft Group Policies. And that's great if you have control of your environment. It's not great if you're trying to apply this policy to a third-party contractor system that you can't apply policies to. So um, what customer would have to do in the past is they'd have to build different pools in the Horizon View environment, apply the security settings to the pool itself, 
so you can block access to those things for those users. The problem with that is if you've got a diverse population of people using your environment, you may find yourself in many, many, many different pools just to adhere to these different security policies. So what we're doing now with smart policies is we're leveraging our UEM technology to apply context to the user. So when the user logs on, based on the name of the computer they're logging on from, or the client IP address, or the client MAC address, or any number of other parameters, we can do things like turn off clipboard, turn off client drive mapping, set a piece over IP optimized WAN profile, any number of things that make that connection customized for that user. And it can be the same set of pool desktops that your trusted internal employees are using with a different set of security policies. So this is coming in Horizon 7. It's, a, it's gonna be a great offering. Um, another thing that we're doing, and I'm sure Ken will touch on this in its Horizon Air hybrid mode, is we spent a significant amount of time unifying some of our administrative interfaces. Um, in classic Horizon product, you've got your view administrator console, you've got your view composer console for image management, you've got an app volumes console for app stack management, you've got a UEM console, and that's obviously complicated. And then you've got a VROPS console for monitoring and analytics. Um, so what we spent a lot of time doing over the course of the last two years is finding a way to build a new unified platform that's HTML5 based that brings together all these things. Um, we'll be bringing that to market with the Horizon Air hybrid mode. Um, so you guys get a first chance to see that and hopefully Ken can show you guys a demo of some of that uh, in his uh, breakout later. Uh, we announced the App Volumes 3.0 product launch. And um, I don't know if most of the people in this room are aware of what App Volumes does, but at a very high level, we do just-in-time software delivery to virtual desktops. And the main advantage of this is you can have a customer that calls the help desk and says, I can't open this .vsd file, I, I, don't, I don't have Visio, I can't open the document. You can assign the Visio app stack to that VDI user, and while they're logged into their desktop, simultaneously, like, or instantaneously, Visio will snap into that desktop and they'll be able to open the document. No one else in the market can do this kind of instantaneous snap-in of software, uh, as well as be able to share software packages across thousands, hundreds or thousands of different virtual desktops. Uh, what we've done in App Volumes 3.0, that's, uh, that's, that's very interesting, is uh, we now have a automated capture tool that will allow you to do kind of command line conversion of existing uh, Windows installer packages and automatically generate uh, App Volumes app stacks, as well as output a uh, isolated thin app application if you want to isolate that app. Uh, in addition, we have a new technology offering called App Toggle. And what App Toggle is, is something that controls the visibility of a piece of software based on user, user entitlements. Now, App Volumes always did that, but let me give you a use case scenario where this, makes, this will make a lot of sense for you. Um, prior to App Volumes 3.0, if you wanted to deliver something like Microsoft Office to your users, you would take Office Pro Plus, which you license for every single person in your enterprise, and you'd either bake it into your image or you'd make an App Volumes app stack and give it to everybody in your environment. But then you've got Visio and Project. And I've never seen a customer that's, that's paid for Visio and Project for every single user. They always have like 200 licenses of this, 500 of that, and they give it to different people uh, based on the requirements. So historically with App Volumes, we would have told you to make three App Volumes app stacks, one for Office Pro Plus, one for Visio, one for Project, and set separate AD entitlements for those. Uh, what we're doing with App Toggle is we're telling you to put those now into one singular app stack, and we will control the visibility of the applications based on individual AD entitlements. I want to make sure I'm very clear on this visibility thing. We are not blocking access to the EXE through like a software restriction policy or app locker. We are literally making it not visible on disk. So it won't be in the file system. It won't be in the registry. You won't have a... Uh, um, uh, a challenge where you try to invoke one office app through Olay from another office app and you get some error message like you can't run this application. It's literally not on disk. So now when you got to patch your office applications, you're patching it in one place rather than three places and you're still able to control the visibility on a per group entitlement basis. So pretty exciting stuff there. Um, SDDC integration, I'm not going to touch on much other than to say you know, a lot of the work that we do within Horizon is to take advantage of vSphere core platform capabilities where we can. So we're doing a lot of work around integration with vSAN to be able to solve some of the complexity and cost issues with scaling virtual desktops. We're doing a lot of integration with NSX for things like micro-segmentation where we can actually improve the state of a virtual desktop security by limiting the view of the data center and controlling east-west traffic. So there are such certain situations where we are leveraging core capabilities in uh, ESX and NSX to actually make the EUC offering better, uh, more secure, and more scalable. One of the last things I'll touch on really quick, and, uh, and Ken's going to go on this uh, right after me as well as in a, in a breakout session, is our, our, our hybrid uh, uh, cloud platform. 
And specifically, when we talk about hybrid, um, we mean that you can host desktops in the cloud if you want to. You can host them on-prem. What we're focusing on doing is giving you a unified way of managing those resources. So whether the desktops are on-prem or in the cloud, you'll have one unified way to manage them. Um, and through uh, some of the technology, Ken will talk to you about our smart node technology. We're going to basically allow you to kind of automatically scale out your on-prem environment uh, through our new Project Enzo architecture. Uh, so that it becomes very easy to deploy and scale out a VDI environment without having to have a whole bunch of different moving parts uh, to assemble the solution. So Ken's going to go into a lot more detail uh, about this new solution. And of course, um, part of that whole, that whole architecture is to leverage uh, vSAN ready nodes where we can. Um, a lot of our OEM partners, HP, Dell, all these uh, server manufacturers are producing servers that are now vSAN ready. And with some of the new advancements we have in vSAN 6.2, where we're leveraging uh, ability to do uh, compression and deduplication, uh, we can really help uh, improve the circumstance uh, for deploying on-prem VDI. So with that, uh, I think I'm out of time. I appreciate uh, everyone's time. If anyone has any questions, I'll be around the rest of the day, so feel free to grab me. I don't think we have time for any questions, but thanks very much.